Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, The Answer Company. The division championship Minnesota Twins are looking to go all the way to the World Series in 2024. Bolstered by inspirational shortstop Carlos Correa, a healthy Brian Buxton, and rookie phenom Royce Lewis, plus a pitching staff led by Pablo Lopez and an outstanding bullpen featuring Johan Duran, the Twins are the best bargain in the major leagues, and Target Field is the best venue in baseball. Sheridan Dulas and Kins, PA, a family and criminal defense law firm, has been serving clients in Dakota County and throughout Minnesota for over 40 years. Ranked a Tier 1 Best Law Firm by U.S. News and World Report every year since 2009, Sheridan Dulas and Kins are here to help you in your most difficult life circumstances. Established in 2007, 45th Parallel Spirits was among the first 50 micro distilleries in the United States. Based in New Richmond, Wisconsin, all aspects of production occur at our facility. If you're interested in visiting and learning more about the 45th Parallel Distillery, please check our website and plan a visit to tour our facility and taste our spirits. Truestone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. Truestone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. Truestone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Access to Democracy. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, and we're beginning a new healthcare segment on Access to Democracy. Today's our first episode, and it's a real pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Maria Colazzo Clavel, who has been a friend and colleague with me at Mayo Clinic for many, many years. Dr. Clavel is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science, and she's a senior member of the Department of Internal Medicine and the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, Metabolism, and Nutrition. She received her medical degree from uh, Ponce Medical School in Puerto Rico, and then came to Mayo Clinic for her residency in both internal medicine and in endocrinology, and she joined the staff of Mayo Clinic in 1997. Her research interests uh, include the evaluation and management of patients with obesity and long-term outcomes of patients after bariatric surgery. And that's going to be the topic of our discussion today. We're going to be talking about obesity in general and the various uh, options that are available for patients that are overweight or obese. And so, Dr. Clavel, welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm thrilled to have you here. We've been colleagues and friends for, for many, many years and have worked together. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you for not saying how long we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> I was in medical school when you came on staff. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. So I, I thought we would go ahead and get started with our discussion. Uh, Dr. Clavel, I thought first what we would do is... It, uh, uh, create some definitions for the audience, mm -hmm. and maybe you could tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the terms that we frequently use, uh, BMI, uh, ideal body weight, overweight, obesity. So why don't we start there so that we're all using the same terminology? Yeah, that's a great place to start because when people struggle with being overweight, uh, there's been so much terminology over the years that always have kind of a negative connotation. And the one thing I always like to say is like, when we use this terminology of BMI or overweight or obesity, we're really just talking about health risk. You know, we really don't want to come into the conversation with any kind of judgment or bias about that, even though we know many of our patients have struggled with that um, in their lives. So really, uh, BMI, which stands for body mass index, was developed to give us an easy guide as to when to worry about somebody's weight. Um, 
And essentially, it's a very easy calculation. It takes your height and weight, and we get a number. Uh, so we take uh, the weight in kilograms and divide it by the height meter squared. And essentially, over decades, we've looked at data as to at which level do we start worrying about health risk? Okay. When do people start experiencing problems with their blood sugar, with their blood pressure? And that allowed us to kind of define at which BMI should we worry. So if you look at the literature or if you look at any kind of uh, information, a normal or let's say uh, BMI that's not associated with as high risk usually is between 18 and a half and 25. There are all kinds of ways of calculating that. So there are some risks to being underweight. Most people that have BMIs between 25 and 30, we consider overweight. And there, the health risk may not be as high unless you have a strong family history. So BMI is not a perfect measure. But we definitely start worrying about health when people start having BMI, so above 30 or definitely above 35. That's when we recognize that when we're gaining extra weight with BMIs above 35, it's not all going to be muscle. Some of it will be fatty tissue, which can be associated with health risk. Um, so we're all really focusing on how do we identify the person that's at risk when it comes to health complications. Great. That, that, that's very helpful. So, um, you know, as a society, we're, we're all getting heavier. And it's really one of the major healthcare problems, mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but throughout the world. And why is this happening? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a pretty complex uh, question to answer, but suffice it to say that over the past 30, 40 years, our genetics have not changed. Uh, but what has changed is our environment. Uh, we're definitely less active today than we were 20, 30 years ago. Our uh, availability to food has definitely changed um, today compared to 30 years ago. So that interplay of just having greater availability to food while we're being less active, uh, we're le burning less calories, is really the main culprit to why we, we're getting heavier. And if uh, studies have been done looking at behaviors at each age uh, uh, group uh, that are associated with weight gain. And in young kids and adolescents, is very much uh, uh, monitor time, right? Screen time. As we get older, it becomes sedentary behavior. We just don't do as much in our day-to-day -day activity. And this is outside of exercise. Uh, we just, and with the pandemic, right, when people were working from home, mm -hmm. more remote work, you don't even have to walk the corridor to get anywhere. That has certainly affected all this. You, you mentioned a couple of the comorbidities that are associated mm -hmm. with, with weight gain. What are, what are some of the other ones yeah. that we think about? So we always worry about uh, kind of metabolic complications. What does that mean? Metabolic uh, means how your body uh, controls blood sugar, blood pressure, uh, blood fats, sometimes fatty deposition in the liver, which is are things that we worry about. And then we worry about the mechanical complications, you know, the joint discomfort. Uh, sometimes people suffer from a condition called sleep apnea. That's very much kind of a mechanical complication of excess weight around the neck. So when I evaluate people, I try to get a sense of, okay, what's happening? How is the body tolerating this extra, fluid, extra uh, uh, weight? And honestly, try to identify health goals when we're talking about weight loss, because we do want to improve health, but specifically, what should those health goals be? And many people may not be as clear in their minds as to what can improve if I lose 10 or 20 pounds. Um, sometimes people think they have to lose a lot more weight than they might need to, mm -hmm. to improve aspects of their health. What about diet and exercise? Mm. That's always the first thing we hear about in terms of controlling weight. Does yeah. it work? Yes, uh, and hence the challenge. You know, many diets work, and I think so many of uh, so many individuals are just confused by all the information that's out there. Um, sometimes I can eat this. Sometimes I can eat that. And, and it adds to the confusion over something that we have to do every day, right? Every day we decide what we're gonna eat. Um, definitely a big change has been the calorie density of foods. Um, certainly, for example, a slice of pizza today that might have cheese in the crust, it has cheese, double the cheese, double the meat, 
has a lot more calories than a slice of pizza that maybe you got 20 years ago that was probably even smaller. Um, so I feel understanding um, where are these excess calories coming from? Is that your choice or is that somebody else's choice? I'm very much into helping my patients decide what are the changes that they want to make. Um, so cutting back calories is key, consuming less than what you're burning. I would say physical activity, we know, helps protect health, whether it's associated with weight loss or not. So I'm really a big proponent of helping my patients do what they can activity-wise, recognizing that some may have more limitations than others. So do you recommend any certain diet or are you just trying to get the patient to change their eating habits for life? Yeah. Great question. I would say that we would think about specific diets when there are specific health conditions that we need to be mindful about. You know, somebody has kidney dysfunction or something that really impacts what they should be consuming when it mm -hmm. comes to proteins and, and fats. When it comes to overall eating habits, in the person that's otherwise um, healthy, really what we're looking for is where can our patients start making changes to drop back calories, to consume less calories. And I will tell you that every diet works as long as people are able to adhere to it and they're consuming less calories. So here's where, the, where does our, um, the person that we're seeing is willing to start? Where do they wanna start? And long term, we do want to guide them towards healthier choices. Uh, obviously, the less calorie dense foods, the healthier fats, the higher fiber. Uh, but when you say that all at once, it's hard to implement that all at once. So mm -hmm. where does our patient want to start and how do we support them? Now, having said all that, um, it is important to recognize that sometimes people can only achieve so much weight loss with just their efforts at eating and activity habits. Some people may need to lose more weight and their efforts at eating and activity habits may not be enough. And that's, way, that's when we start thinking about can a medication help our patients? Can a weight loss surgery help our patients? And obviously what we expect from that is we do expect more weight loss um, in order to help our patient achieve their health goal. Okay, okay great. So what about intermittent fasting? We hear a lot about that. Yeah, intermittent fasting has been getting a lot of attention recently. And the interesting thing about intermittent fasting is that there are many different studies that have looked at intermittent, intermittent fasting. Some are actually fast. People will fast, every, studies where people fasted every other day. By a fast, it was defined by taking less than 500 calories, so mainly liquid mm. calories. Uh, Probably when people say intermittent fasting, what they mean really is time-restricted eating, meaning I'm only going to eat for so many hours. And those studies have been done where people had windows of eating between six to eight hours, and then they fasted mm -hmm. over that. The interesting thing when you read the studies and when you hear people uh, what they're doing, many times they're not following uh, the, the specifics of how their studies were done. Most of these studies were done where people consume most of their calories earlier in the day. Okay, so if it was a six hour window, uh, then we're looking at nine to three or 10 to four, if it was an eight hour window. But usually in most of these studies, the last meal was usually be before three to 4 p.m., which is very hard to do in real life because most of us are working at three to 4 p.m. So mm -hmm. it's so, so I would tell you that most people are doing some modification to that. Um, but the key thing is that people still have to limit calories. So consuming a bunch of food in these many hours uh, may not help you with weight loss. The interesting thing is some of these studies have shown that when you consume most of your calories earlier in the day and avoid eating within three to four hours of going to sleep, it does have a metabolic benefit. What do I mean by that? It can improve blood sugar, blood pressure, even though people may not lose weight. Um, so, so there are different goals that we can achieve, but when people come to me ask, telling me they're doing intermittent fasting, I'm asking, Craig, what are you doing? And I try to guide them towards making those changes that I know will be associated with health benefits. Okay. So, be honest with us, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. What percent of people that need to lose weight 
for health reasons actually do so and sustain it? With diet and exercise. With diet and exercise. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of the hard truth about the literature that I think the medical community didn't really want to accept for a long time. And I would tell you that I live that, that um, over the past 20 years, that kind of insistence that this patient should be able to achieve this with just diet and exercise, when clearly many studies didn't show that. And if I would tell you that if we think about achieving a 10% weight loss, uh, so for a 200 pound individual, 20 pounds, for a 300 pound individual, 30 pounds, when we look at the literature and when we look at people receiving intense support, coaching, you know, regular visits, um, only about two out of 10 will be able to achieve that 10% weight loss and keep it off at a couple of years. So it's hard. And some of this has to do with how the body adapts to weight loss. It does, it adapts, mm -hmm. it makes it harder. It wants you to regain your weight. So for a long time, we really didn't recognize that or understand that. And I would say that that's probably has been one of the most interesting and exciting things over the past 10, 15 years is having a better understanding of why do people struggle? People lose weight all the time. Why do they struggle with regain? and developing um, therapies that can help with that. Yeah. Well, well, we'll talk a little bit about the new medications that are out there, but maybe first, from a historical perspective, we'll talk a little bit about surgery mm -hmm. for obesity. So yeah. when, is it, when is it indicated, and is it a cure-all, yeah. and is it sustainable for the patient? Yeah. Tell us about weight, a little bit about weight loss surgery, because it's been around for many, many decades. 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 Uh, and, um, and obviously, we first met when we were in right. this field. And I, I remember when I started in this field, um, weight, weight loss surgery or bariatrics was really not looked upon as a really good treatment. Um, but it, it wasn't until really the literature showed how it significantly impacted uh, people's lives, how it normalized blood sugars, how it improved people's mobility, people's quality of life, um, so that today it is a well-accepted surgery. Now, these surgeries evolve over time. Obviously, mm -hmm. they're always trying to be perfected. Uh, what I would say is that surgeries for weight loss clearly have a role um, in our treatment of our patient, a lot guided by what are the, the health goals that we need to achieve. They're safe. They do require preparation. And the toughest part is not getting the surgery, I would say, is after surgery. I always tell people, whoever, if anybody tells you surgery was the easy way out, they don't know what they're talking about, okay? Because it's an ongoing effort. And, and sometimes people might focus on uh, people that might struggle after weight loss surgery. But I will tell you this, bariatric surgery as of today is the one effective weight loss treatment that has been shown to improve survival, improve quality of life, has multiple other health benefits. Now, I'm not saying that it's, it's, a, it's a give all for everybody. Everybody should be evaluated carefully, but it's really an appropriate treatment um, that in patients that would benefit should be considered um, because there are many benefits that have been shown. Um, and sometimes people focus on the potential negatives. There's negatives to everything we do. Uh, knee replacement, everything, mm -hmm. heart surgery. Uh, but it's kind of balancing, you know, that benefit and risk. Um, and uh, the more we learn about it, the more we hear um, how people benefit from these operations. So we always talked about that surgery is really a tool mm -hmm. and it kind of sets the clock back mm -hmm. and improves the patient's health. What, what's the long-term success rate? This yeah. is something that you've looked into quite a bit. Yeah, so a lot depends on which surgery um, is performed. There are many different operations that do vary in how they promote weight loss, and most of them do um, do some limitation in eating, restrict eating. Some impact how food is digested. Um, so for example, people might become less tolerant of cer certain carbohydrates, for example. The more aggressive ones are the more malabsorptive surgeries. And these are the ones that we do have to be careful about. People require a lot of vitamin supplementation. 
You can envision that the ones that are more aggressive, more malabsorbed, if your body's not absorbing most of what you're eating, do tend to be associated with the most weight loss, best chance at maintaining weight loss. But it does come at a price when it comes to nutrition. Uh, the ones that are middle of the row, which would be the gastric bypass, um, most people would lose at least 30% of their weight. 10 years out, people will keep off at least 25% of their weight. Some people do regain, but it's not the majority. Um, but it's important when people notice that some weight regain that we help our patients out. You know, these are tools, like you said, and many other things can come into play that can sabotage that person's success. Um, so addressing that becomes really important. And, and those ones that mainly limit eating uh, for the gastric sleeve, some people out there may know some of these surgeries. Um, with that surgery, there is less weight loss. There's a little bit higher risk of weight regain. But again, the idea is how do we help our patient be successful? And when obstacles arise, because they will, um, how do we help our patient in that situation um, help with maintenance? And sometimes we lose weight as well. And, and what are some of the long-term problems that you've seen associated, particularly with uh, gastric bypass surgery? Yeah, yeah. I would tell you that um, the more aggressive the surgery, uh, the more we have to be careful with follow-up because, um, again, if people aren't getting their supplements, they can run into a lot of problems. And with the gastric bypass, um, and, and you can kind of comment on this uh, better than I, but obviously early around the time of surgery, there's some surgical risk there, right? When it comes to surgical complications, mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, 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 that need to be taken care of. But after the first year, really what we're assessing is how can we help our patient be successful? How can we prevent nutritional uh, deficiencies? And I would say most people follow up, take their supplements, their risk for nutritional deficiencies is really low. Well, Dr. Colvell, let's, let's start talking now about uh, the biggest topic in obesity management, namely medications. Tell us about some of the medications and how they work and are they effective and what are the, what's the downside? And also a little bit about, we, we, we mentioned this about shaming. Mm -hmm. A lot of people mm -hmm. are getting shamed because they're going, using mm -hmm. these drugs to lose weight. Yeah. So we have had medications uh, for uh, weight management for decades, but definitely the newer agents, the injectable therapies, are really quite exciting uh, because they are more efficacious. They help people lose more weight. And they do so physiologically. What I mean is that they do impact appetite at the level of the brain in a way that they're very effective. Uh, so I've heard people tell me, I've never felt full after a meal. Now I feel full after a meal. Before I was always preoccupied with food. Now I'm not preoccupied with food. So what that does is that it helps people be able to adhere to the dietary changes. And what happens is that um, people are able to consume less calories so they lose more weight. So we touched on that 10% weight loss mm -hmm. before and how many people struggle to even achieve that and keep it off with just diet and exercise. That 10% weight loss with some of these weekly injectables is achieved by eight to nine out of 10 people. About half the people can lose over 15 or 20% of their weight. So these are weight losses that can come pretty close to weight loss surgery. And they're weight losses that can lead to significant improvements in diabetes, hypertension, many other uh, heart conditions as well. So they're quite effective. With the shaming, I think, you know, what happens is we don't think of being overweight or obese as a disease. We always are judging people. Uh, we don't judge people if they develop heart disease. Um, and that's what's happening here. And that's really because we lacked understanding as to why do people struggle with their weight and why, do, when they lose weight, they have difficulties keeping it off. And over the past 10 years, it's been incredibly exciting in, in understanding why do our patients struggle and better still have treatments right. that can help them be successful. And we have a lot more drugs lot coming more down coming. the line. And yeah. Dr. Clavel, thank you so much for being our inaugural guest <laughs> for this healthcare segment. And uh, this has really been very informative and uh, a pleasure to see you again and uh, to have a chance to interact with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a treat. Okay.